Joining me now as we look at the new wave of activism on college campuses, Readin, Writin, and Race. Stacy Washington of the National Advisory Council of Project 21, the National Leadership Network of Black Conservatives. Ari Cohn, Senior Program Officer at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And Corey Walker, a Dean at Winston-Salem State University in North Carolina. Ari Cohn, there are stories coming from campuses around the country of things that go all the way from sort of um, benign ignorance, misunderstanding, all the way to outright hostile racial intolerance and animus. It sounds terrible. Your organization has its ear to the ground in campuses around the country. What does it seem like is, is going on there? Well, I should say that students who are expressing these grievances um, are experiencing something. And, and what that, that is, I, I can't tell you directly. I'm not on campus. Uh, fire is not on campus. Uh, what matters to us is that these students are free to express their, their concerns and air their grievances, uh, and it's very important that they be allowed to do so and granted the expressive rights to engage in this kind of protest, which is exactly how change and progress happens. Corey Walker, you're working at a historically black college, but I know that you've worked in other places. What's the temper? When, when you see these things rolling out across the country, what's your impression of it? What you're seeing is a new generation of students who are connecting their movements on campus to broader movements for change across society and even in, across the world. When you look at the black student movement in Missouri, I think uh, immediately to the Fees Must Fall movement in South Africa, and also the different, uh, different movements around for globalization, uh, for globalizing democratic societies that we see uh, in and around Europe and around Latin and South America. So this is a broad uh, trend of folks who are looking at how do we change society? How do we make it more equitable? How do we really live up to our, our freedoms and our constitutional rights and obligations? And more importantly, how do we do this within a broad, pluralistic, democratic society? This is a new generation attempting to update democracy for the 21st century and utilizing new media technologies to connect it to broader movements, to other movements, so that it is not isolated, that the campus and the community are one, and that this campus and community nexus speaks to the broader issues throughout our country. Corey Walker, you're an administrator, you're a dean. Are you surprised that uh, so many heads have rolled in the past couple of weeks and there have been the demands for many more? No, I'm not surprised. Uh, one thing that we're seeing is students are really rising up uh, and looking for new leadership, looking for bold, innovative leadership, looking for leadership that's more than just uh, giving mouth language to issues around uh, how a college should operate, but more importantly, being true intellectual leaders and being bold intellectual leaders. To say that the ideas around democracy or ideas around inclusivity or ideas around diversity are core values of the institutions and should be part of the everyday practice of every institution. The students are rightly and justly holding administrators accountable, not only for their language, but more importantly for the institutional practices that must be felt, that must be real in their everyday life, and must be a part of their educational experience. These are students who are committed in the deepest, truest, deepest, truest sense to a broad and deep democracy. And our administrators, uh, my colleagues, should be should make sure that we listen to them, listen to them carefully, but most importantly, act responsibly and act in a manner that really fulfills uh, our mandate for being academic and intellectual leaders at these institutions. Stacey Washington, you're watching this roll out across the country, but you're based in the Midwest. Um, do these students have a legit gripe, and are they choosing the right weapons to fight their battles? Well, I think they possibly do have a legitimate um, thing that they're protesting. The question is, should they have, uh, some of them on academic scholarship, stepped away from that and thumbed their nose at taxpayers and individuals who are helping to fund their college experience by saying they would strike from playing football? 
and should they ignore the knockout attacks that have been so prevalent on the University of Missouri campus that Fox 2 News has a hotspot map and their children and these are the children of Missouri citizens having facial reconstructive surgery. I think if you want to be heard and you want your concerns to be validated, you have to come from a position of bringing everyone together and not excluding any of the issues that might be impacting the campus where you're protesting. <coughs> By bringing up those two points in close proximity to each other. Do you mean to imply that anybody involved with the football team is also involved with these knockout attacks? No, that's not what I said at all. What okay. I'm saying is if we're talking about the, uh, the atmosphere on a campus, all of the things that play a factor should be considered. If white students feel attacked by members of the community, the greater community in Columbia, and they're having their lives endangered, being beaten to within an inch of their life, and those are the white students' concerns, and the black students are receiving um, some kind of exclusion or what, what have you, then those are things that impact the dialogue and the decision by, say, the university president on how to approach or listen to the concerns of each side. So I'm advocating for everyone to sit down and have a conversation about what's going on on campus, to hear each other, and then make some decisions instead of just protesting and asking for people to be fired, asking white people to denounce their privilege. What privilege? Some white people don't have lots of money. Some of them don't have um, the benefits of being a part of the 1%, if you will. How do you know every white person has privilege? These are discussions that if you leave the rhetoric out and just have conversations, it could be, the solutions could be had. Guests stay with us. Among the rights any student can claim on campus, does he or she have the right to demand not to be offended? The tumult at Yale and the controversy swirling around the first black dean of the college began with Halloween costumes and the insistence that when it came to dressing up, there were no-go areas. Reading, writing, and race, it's the inside story. You're watching Inside Story, I'm Ray Suarez. If you're a minority student at a mixed race school, should you regard the school as a mere extension of a society which sometimes excludes you, mocks you, treats you insensitively? Or should you carry with you onto campus the expectation that you shouldn't have to put up with the offense, the mockery, the condescension? How you answer that question depends on how you understand the role of the university, whether it's a free speech, free fire zone, or a place where you make a deal with the school and other students that you shouldn't have to put up with a steady stream of baloney that the rest of the society all too regularly dishes out. Ari Cohn of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, Stacy Washington, host of Stacy on the Right, a radio program, and Corey Walker of Winston-Salem State University are still with me. And uh, Corey Walker, I do not mean to dismiss these concerns at all, but one of the hallmarks of this recent wave of demonstrations has been sometimes attempts to control the way other people use language. Should we be concerned? Well, I don't think we should be concerned. What I think we should be begin to do is to understand how language is uh, a, a key medium for our struggles and how we understand and define our society, how we understand and define ourselves, how we understand and define who we are as American citizens, and that has always been subject for debate, that has always been up for grabs, that has always been contested by various groups throughout American history and throughout our history as human beings. What we have to do is to make sure we, we don't conflate the real issues of students facing a very hostile, very, very intense, and very uh, uh, physically violent environment with certain ideas around uh, free speech that are deemed in the abstract that seek, to, that seek to unite us, which we all agree on, but actually operate very divisively in terms of negating and denying the very presence, the very identity of individuals in their physical being. Ari Kohn, um, it, it sounds trivial, but it's not. Uh, there were a lot of heated arguments at Yale about whether some kinds of costumes should be allowed at Halloween. And really, if, if people want to dress up offensively, on campus, does the campus have a say about that? 
Well, a campus can certainly encourage its students to, to think carefully before they do certain things. Uh, and colleges are there to educate their students. <clears throat> so in some sense, yes, uh, college and university can certainly encourage whatever it would, it would, values it would like to instill in its students. Uh, but I think that making the argument that free speech is a distraction doesn't do it enough service. Free speech is critically important, particularly on a college campus. And yes, it might distract from the underlying message that these protesters are trying to make, but these protesters should then stop calling for censorship and, and other illiberal demands. They're creating the distraction by putting free speech at the forefront of it. And to be clear, these students have absolutely every right to advocate for any kind of censorship they'd like, but it's incumbent on university administrators to not accede to those demands uh, to protect the role of higher education as a the marketplace of ideas. Stacy Washington, just yesterday at Smith College in Massachusetts, the organizers of a student sit-in excluded the media, including on-campus reporters, saying by taking a neutral stance, journalists and media are being complacent in our fight and thus making sure their city wasn't covered. I, I found it a perverse set of ideas being offered there. Well, it's interesting because the way you get your protest uh, to have a lot of attention put on it is to admit the media and to talk to them about why you're protesting, to clearly articulate your ideas and your passion for what you believe in so that they'll then spread that out into the greater society. Everyone sees the media coverage and they maybe catch the fire and head over to Twitter or some online social media and offer some support. It's a really limited idea that you can't allow the media to come in and listen to what you're chanting about or what you're protesting about. So they're hurting themselves. But we're seeing that all over. Here at Mizzou, the students said, these are healing spaces. White students aren't allowed, so this is a black healing space. They also said they didn't want media there. A student who also contributes to ESPN was forcibly told, look, we're going to remove you. We're going to bring some guys over here and have you kicked out. And all he wanted to do was find out why they were protesting, get some photographs, and spread the message that, hey, there's a newsworthy story going on here. So it's really, it, it goes against what they're looking for, and it's perplexing. Yes, stay with us. One of the most striking parts of the University of Missouri story was the role played by the school's football team. Players' support for students demanding a better campus environment ended up playing a big role in the unfolding drama at Missouri. Reading, writing, and race, it's the inside story. Welcome back to Inside Story, I'm Ray Suarez. One of the most remarkable aspects of the showdowns at the University of Missouri was the role played by the Tigers, the Mizzou football team. They said they weren't going to play in an upcoming game against Brigham Young University unless the president resigned and the university addressed claims about the hostile racial atmosphere on campus. The school faced losing a million dollars if the players didn't suit up and take the field the administration folded, the president resigned, the game was played, and the Tigers beat BYU 20 to 16. Reading, writing, and race this time on the program. Still with me, Ari Cohn, Corey Walker, and Stacy Washington. And Stacy, earlier in the program, you brought up the football team. Didn't they show that, in many ways, they're the most powerful black people on campus? Well, and um, with good reason, because they waited until they had a million dollars on the line with the BYU game, money that was already spent, and then they lodged their demand. They're, we're not going to play football unless uh, he resigns. I think he should have come back to them and said, anyone who's not at practice tomorrow night and who's here on a scholarship has their scholarship revoked and those students won't be on campus anymore because they'll need to pack up and leave. That would have made a distinct choice for those students because it's not fair to use something that's not yours, namely scholarship activity, playing football, to impress upon the university president a point about whether or not he's dealing with race. Again, I just think they should have had other means of approaching this situation. And he admitted he hadn't been addressing their concerns in a timely fashion, but to have him resign and to leave them without any leadership, and now they're starting again with someone new, 
I don't think it was handled properly and it, it was a lack of leadership when he was there and now there's a lack of leadership because they're transitioning into someone new. Corey Walker, it's, uh, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to say that often minority athletes are some of the most conservative people on campus because they're being very careful, walking the straight and narrow and hoping to someday cash in with a major payday. They often don't stick their necks out and here we saw them do it in a very public way at Missouri. Well, what I think you, what you're seeing is a, a stream. You can look at the 1968 Olympics. You can look at the ways in which uh, student athletes have historically uh, been a part of uh, freedom movements and movements for liberation. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're conservative. It means that they see themselves as first and foremost what they are. They are students. And in many ways, this conversation uh, and this public discussion has moved away from the very fact that these are students who have to make tremendous, uh, tremendous re uh, obligations to their uh, athletic prowess. But first and foremost, they are there at the University of Missouri to get an education. And when that education is being impeded by an environment that does not facilitate the, their holistic development, then they have every right and every obligation to respond. And they responded well. And and rightly so that the, the leadership, the academic leadership, uh, understood that this wasn't just a recent failure of leadership, but this was a systemic failure of leadership that needed to be replaced. I think we need to focus most importantly that these are students. They're students at the University of Missouri, and they have to have an educational environment that enhances their intellectual abilities, that prepares them to take whatever direction in life, whether it's on the playing field or in a courtroom. But what or about Stacey Washington's point education. that they, they are, in many cases, most cases, scholarship students, and in fact, are being compensated for playing football and being, and their tuitions being paid at the university? They're being paid, they're, they're being, uh, they're, they have received a scholarship for their athletic prowess, but it's a scholarship for their education. And if their education is not being fulfilled, if they don't have an environment where they can fully uh, take advantage of that education, then they have to rightly and justly look at the entire system in which they're in. They're not just going to be quiet and not do anything and just play on the football field. Ari, that is I, I unreasonable a, and that's inhuman. A short amount of time for Ari Cohen toward the end of the program. Ari, is there a teachable moment here? Can we really have a very necessary debate about the First Amendment and free speech on campus galvanized by what we see happening on campuses? I think absolutely. Uh, and I think President Barack Obama said it best the other day when he said that to be a good activist, to be a good citizen, you have to make sure that you're listening to the other side and everyone is hearing each other out and that's how we do it and that we should not be afraid of bad ideas. We counter bad ideas with more ideas. The remedy for bad speech is bed sp better speech. Thanks a lot. I want to thank my guests, Corey Walker, a dean at Winston-Salem State University, Stacy Washington of the National Advisory Council of Project 21, the National Leadership Network of Black Conservatives, and Ari Cohn, Senior Program Officer at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. I'll be back in a moment with a final thought on prejudice and how hard it is to kill bad ideas, even really bad ones. Stay with us. It's Inside Story. <laughs>